Hello and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a black sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Alu. I'm kind of delighted this week, Liz. This delighted? Was super fun. Pretty delightful. This episode was, was maybe made to delight you. There was a lot of pretty <laughs> wonderful Jack. And some excellent, what do you call it, Fliver? Uh, no, we don't. That was a Silver? joke amongst friends. Fliver. No, we don't. Well, we, we don't anyway, officially call it that at all. The but Flint yes, Silver no. relationship, the bromance, the Flint Silver is pretty yes. great. Yes, but yeah, mostly, mostly I'm I'm here for the. I guess we can't really call it Gen X because we only get a little bit of Anne, but still. <gasps> but oh, really, the Anne that we get is lovely, it's amazing, amazing. The Gen X, and no, the Gen X is beautiful in this. The Gen X is beautiful, and can I just say? Mm-hmm. Grandma Guthrie is my new favorite thing. I'm just saying it now. Like oh, I love Grandma great. Guthrie. I am crazy for Grandma Guthrie. Grandma <laughs> Guthrie is my thing. That coat, though, right with the fur lining. Mm, the, uh, I need just that. Everything. I need everything it. about her. I need so, it. Let me just say. Let okay. me first of all. Let me just say that this is a Lucas Etlin directed episode. <gasps> oh, of course so, it is. Mm-hmm. It's funny because they had the, the shot of the great, the great shot of the ship, and I and I remembered essentially pirate pi- parasols. <laughs> it right. just came into my brain. <laughs> That's so That's funny. funny. Mm-hmm. Now this was a quieter one. He also did episode one of this season. This is a quieter oh, yeah. episode for Lucas. But yes, we do love Lucas, and we'll hopefully be talking to him soon. Yeah. And uh, so Grandma Guthrie is Dame Harriet Walter who is, for those of us who love Jane Austen like crazy, Mm -hmm. Fanny Dashwood in Sense and Sensibility. Yes! Oh, my God. She's the best and the worst. I didn't recognize her, but you're absolutely... I mean, like, I knew that I knew that actress. It was a long time ago. She's looking a bit different now. It was a long time ago. Yes. (laughs) Oh, man. Um, She was delightful. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh. She was delightful. Yes. So I love her very much. Sense and Sensibility is a favorite of mine. So yes, exactly. Um, so yes, really just crazy for her. So mm-hmm. be prepared, everyone. Yeah, um, she was wonderful. And we have a little bit of news. Uh, you and I had the most fun talking to Hannah New. We sure did. She's my new best friend. Sorry, Daphne, move over. Sarah, who? Uh- <laughs> No, no. <laughs> Hannah New is my new best friend. Sorry, That's Liz. That's true. Y'all got to talk like an hour after I had to hang up because spoilers. <laughs> so, oh, yes. Yeah, so, in addition, <laughs> so, in addition to a regular Hannah New episode coming out sometime next week when I finish editing it, mm-hmm. where she is so fun and, and so, so interesting. Smart. Yes. And just, just a captivating yeah, right? yeah. Yes. We. We we saw all these new things about Eleanor, and it was amazing. Yeah. It makes me want to go back and watch the show from the beginning with just a brand new appreciation for Eleanor from the beginning. Let's she do has it. She has such let's, a strong grasp of the character. Yes. <laughs> and in addition to that, um, we did. you did have to leave us, and Hannah and I continued to have a conversation because I thought the timing was amazing. For the two of us to have a little conversation about Grandma Guthrie. Mm-hmm, of course. And so, um, because that was all I could think about was Eleanor. To be, I mean, yes. I could think about a lot of things. It's an amazing scene on so many levels, but mm-hmm. I just, the, I felt like the ghost of Eleanor was in that room and I mm-hmm. wanted to talk to Hannah about it. And the timing was perfect. So uh, Hannah and I had a conversation about that. And that is actually going to be a Patreon exclusive. So anyone who would like to hear that, bit of conversation which was fascinating and fun and we had had a bit to drink by then so possibly even more fun than <laughs> other things uh, uh-huh. liz tell yes. everyone how they oh so let's explain for people who ha- are our newer listeners uh we have in it how do we describe it we we are on a website called patreon mm-hmm. which is how we have subscribers who who give us money on a monthly basis to Common Room Radio, which Fathoms Deep is a podcast of Common Room Radio. Mm-hmm. And in exchange for that, you get all sorts of 
bonus content, right? Like this, like this special interview will be. Uh, and in addition to that, you help us uh, do what is our goal, which is to actually do this for a living. Yes. So um, it's quite time consuming work, you guys. You might not is. know that. It is a lot in of fact. Work. So yeah, a lot of fun, a lot of work. So yes. So Liz, tell everyone where they need to go. It is actually in the show notes and on our sure. website. But, uh-huh. but it's patreon.com slash common room radio. And uh, yep. Yeah, and you can go in there and donate even a dollar a month yep. or more. Mm-hmm. And that will get you all sorts of bonus content. But in addition, it will give you that that little bit of interview. Well, mm-hmm. it ended up being an hour edited. So I don't know how long it'll yeah. be yet. Still editing. <laughs> some, some amount, at least somewhere between half an hour and an hour of, of me and Hannah uh, talking about, about Grandma Guthrie in relation to Eleanor, which is pretty which cool. Is fascinating. I'm looking forward to hearing that. Okay. Uh, okay. So our last announcement is Hey, everyone, we've been having some problems with our website, and we really apologize. We had a period. Terrible, terrible problems. Lots of problems. Yeah. Problems with email, yeah. too. Just problems yeah. across the board. Technology yeah. has not been our friend. No. Well, sometimes mm-hmm. technology is our friend because we get to do this at all. Because like, basically, Liz sure, and I can sure. talk to each other because of technology. But yeah, we have had a lot of challenges. So. So there was a period where you all couldn't download episodes. And then I believe for a lot of people, if not everyone, there might have been a thing where all of the episodes downloaded suddenly out of nowhere. We're so sorry. Our apologies. Yes. Uh, but everything seems to be fixed now. And so... It was our first day at Podcast Pirate Captain School. For real, man. For real. <laughs> And our version of Linus was God knows what. It was some God some technology what. stuff that we don't understand. But luckily... Gremlins in the ether. I don't even know. But luckily, our friend Alistair Stevens, whose pirate name is... What is it? Starbuck Killer Cranky. Starbuck Killer Cranky <laughs> is the best and fixed our website and fixed our feeds uh-huh. to iTunes and things i'm knocking on wood right now things seem to be working okay yeah uh so you will you will get hopefully this episode when it usually drops right after right after the episode of black sales Mm -hmm. and our interviews coming up and um and in recognition of starbuck killer cranky being so amazing and fixing everything for us and putting actually our episodes up on youtube so you'll be able to listen to them there as well Uh, we would like to give him an official role on our ship. Mm. Andrew Dice is our is our cabin boy. We love you, cabin boy. But we declare Starbuck Killer Cranky, aka Alistair Stevens, to be our ship's master. Who ship's master? The ship's master. I like that very much. <laughs> so you are ship's master. Surprising no one. Yes, the rank specializing in navigation. So thank you, mm. thank you for navigating us back to safe internet waters, and uh, <laughs> that we can record all this stuff and it actually gets to people because that's absolutely kind of what we're trying to do. So mm-hmm. all right, now we can move on to our episode. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to break this episode down into three parts. I felt like there were really not not character groups exactly like we usually do, but like mm-hmm. actual geographical places, which have sure. slightly larger character groups. So the first one is the Maroon Island, where we have Flint and Silver and the Queen and Julius and a whole bunch of pirates mm-hmm. and a whole bunch of a whole bunch of people who want to have a revolution and it's super interesting incredible all of a sudden yeah they have so a, many a, people an army there's an army right, yes right right yeah really fascinating uh the second one i want to do is nasa which is uh woods rogers mrs hudson billy and yes Maddie. uh-huh yes, I told uh, you, yes. smoking corpse or nothing. I know, I know. You're yep. right. You're right. Can't Definitely fool me. Not. I've she, been watching TV a long time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she is smoking in totally different way in this episode. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> it is totally the truth. And then I chose just for my own delight, so that we can just spend a really long time talking on them. I chose Philadelphia for our last conversation. Sure. Sounds good. All right. Let's get talking. Prepare to board. Aye. 
Okay, so now we are on the Maroon Island, and we start with heartbreak, even though we Dude, now know that so the heartbreak was not though. necessary. Yeah, it is such a beautiful scene between yeah. Silver and the Queen. Well, and it starts just so quiet. She's, and it rem, it rem, reminded me of um, how we saw Silver last episode when he was at the table, and mm-hmm. it was like after the crying and just the like the crying hangover that you get, I guess. Um, yeah, exactly. but she had that same look of just that her grief had gone beyond tears, and it was mm-hmm. oh, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Mm. Yeah, and he, yeah, he's just a he's just a mess. He is. I feel so bad for yeah. him. Yeah, yeah, drowning. Mm. Yeah, right. Yes. Drowning, exactly we'll get like to that. Clint said. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, so yeah, he he said beautiful things. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know how much we need to go into the actual things he said. I do like that he told her that he loved her and that he thought Maddie might want her to know that. Yes, that he loved <sighs> Maddie. You mean? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Not, that's yeah. okay. You should say it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He might like the queen a lot, too, but no, sure that's not what I meant. <laughs> All right. And then we get to Silver arriving at this assembly of pirates and former slaves, you know, just just mm-hmm. a whole heap of people all interacting with each other. Like, I really I thought it was interesting. Like, you have groupings that were like pirates with pirates and former slaves with former slaves. Right. But you have a lot of groupings of like them mixing. It was pretty yeah. neat. Yeah. And, and even conversations happening. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so Silver comes up, and Anne Flint, as per usual, was <laughs> standing by himself. Oh, but, yes. Uh, but obviously really in tune with everything that's going on in that room. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And and it's interesting. I mean, this is a scene, like, we had the moment last episode when Silver was so losing it and yeah. Julie came up and Flint took over and it seems mm-hmm. like, you know, that's it. They did, they, they passed the baton and yet we still have really gentle Flint here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Flint, it, gentle is absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, it's, it's really, um, yeah, it's very touching. Uh, okay. So, so Silver's like, okay, so this, you know, nobody, nobody's at each other's throat yet. Flint talks about the United front and then he says, how was she? Mm-hmm. And then how are you? <sighs> and then he moves on to, yeah. it was lovely. It, it was, was lovely. Yeah, and then he moves on really to strategy, sweet. but it was yes, really lovely. But it was really sweet. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm just, I, I just really am intrigued still by this Flint. This version of Flint is just so, and again, we said, and I think, you know, a lot of people on Twitter are saying, like, this is McGraw. This isn't actually McGraw. Like, this is, I feel no, like, a new but I think thing. That integration maybe is happening. Yeah, which exactly is scary because that's usually when we lose people. Thank you, Alistair Stevens, for Ooh. making us always afraid of when people start evolving. <laughs> right. But it's true. He seems to be, uh, yeah, to be walking the line of those two halves of himself much more fully to be more fully realized. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and I just kept thinking like how I compared him to teach in season three, that teach was so like, Oh yes. Calm mm-hmm. in his own space. So, so inhabiting his own body in a, yes. in a sense of confidence. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like, I mean, he's not being like teach are very different people, but I feel like that same sense of like Flint now, almost like the two halves have come together yes. and he's inhabiting his body and his being in a way mm. that we've never seen him do. Yeah. Yeah. Cause McGraw was always so kind of like unsure of himself and outward looking, you know what I mean? Like sure. he was so, and Flint, you know, Flint has taken us in a million directions, but they never were balanced. Right. Yes. Yeah. And he was quite unbalanced last season. The, the, right. the most unbalanced we'd ever seen him. Right, well, And he Absolutely. was drowning, is what he said, when he was drowning he was after drowning. Miranda. Was yes. Beautiful description. I know it was. Um, so it was just really interesting because I do feel like Flint, yeah, I, I still can't put my finger exactly on describing it other than to say that I feel like he's fully inhabiting himself. Yes. No, and I think that that's has good. brought him some sort of peace, at least yeah. for now. We have no guarantee that this will stay. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so then they're talking strategy about. I looked. I looked up the place. They're talking about Jamaica, but then suddenly, when Flint says 
Boston. Boston. I know. Then Blew Silver's like, my mind. Boston? Yeah. Holy smokes. <laughs> what? <laughs> yep. And that's when Julia speaks up and says that they're fools. And he uses language we've heard before. He says, yes. if you think the road yes. leads where he says, Which here is we Billy, go again. Right? This yep, is a callback that's to Billy. Billy. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like Julie, Julius gives us callbacks to other pirates. Yes. <laughs> throughout throughout mm-hmm. this, he's not very much time he's on this episode, but he, he spends a lot of time reminding us of other pirates. Mm-hmm. And he says, all the enemy needs to do is divide us. Yeah. And we mm-hmm. know this. I mean, this again, this, this, is, this, is the, this is the theme that is throughout on this section of the, of the episode is being, being together or being divided. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but yes. S- right. But Silver's mm-hmm. the one that freaks out at him. Yes. Which I think is pretty clear. And I actually wanted to go straight from here and go a tiny bit out of order. I wanted to go from here to talking to the conversation between Flint and Silver before we do the conversation between Julius and the okay. Queen. Sure. Okay. Because I feel like you know. So the Queen then steps in and invites Julius to come speak with her. Right. Which I liked very much. Mm-hmm. Because, because I felt like it was important for us to know. She's so regal. I know she's so regal and amazing. And of course, everyone mm-hmm. listens to her, and of course, everyone who had been on New Providence Island understands who she is. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and reveres her, and Julius is one of those people. Um, but I also like that we really. It was important. It, this episode was very important for us to see where she stands. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the last time we left her, it felt very much like, like, yes, she had obviously agreed to Flint's plans, but it felt like this was Maddie, who was more really in agreement, and the Queen. Yes, absolutely. You know what I mean? Who yes. lacked the commitment. Mm-hmm. And I, I liked the, I liked her very tempered commitment that we see in this episode mm-hmm. very much. She's very wise. Yes. She's very wise. This is, mm-hmm. this is the episode of Wise Women and... You know, I yes, just... Yes, it is. You were right. You, you, said t- you said not too long ago about how women were starting to really run the show. Yeah, I shouldn't... I shouldn't yes. Mm-hmm. I yes. like that. Season, season four has been the season of women emerging and women mm-hmm. really just being the voice of yes. wisdom. Even Mrs. Throughout. Hudson in this episode. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Yeah. Love it. Okay. But in the Flint and Silver conversation, um, we understand why Silver's so committed when he lashes out at Julius is that, you know, it's so reminded me of Flint in the beginning of season three, who mm-hmm. was just so, or like the cuss, the part we missed, the part we missed kind of between seasons two and three of mm-hmm. where Flint is so you know, that same thing, that feeling like I, this couldn't, this can't be for nothing. I have to right. do something. This yes. has, this has to mean something, mm-hmm. this death. So I felt like, you know, seeing silver here is like the, the time, the, the time between season, the end of season two and the beginning of season three, where Flint is in that place where he's full of pain and needs to know before he takes the actions that, you know, he's already in the middle of when we get to yes. the beginning of season three. Um, and, and then, yeah, Flint says that thing about drowning. When I was drowning over Miranda, you helped me find a way out. So beautiful, you guys. Uh, this scene was so touching. And he said, then what, look at me, he said to him. He says, look at me. And there's that slow look up that Luke Arnold Mm -hmm. does. Oh, it's Mm -hmm. so gorgeous. And he says, what, I'll promise to do the same to you. I will do the same for you. Ah. Yeah. Now, so I wanted to bring this to the idea of tethers. Oh, of course. It absolutely is a tether. Yes. Essentially, Flint said, you were a tether for me. Mm-hmm. And now I'm offering that for you. Which, what an interesting thing that he's now offering himself as a tether from Silver's own darkness. Right. when that's what Maddie was doing for him. That's so fascinating. For him from Flint's darkness. From Flint, yeah. So I just, I love this, um, this like, interesting kind of intertwinedness that's now being kind of it's being presented as a concept that it wasn't just the one tether of maddie for silver against Mm -hmm. flint 
or to, you know, reemerge from Flint, I guess, let's right. say. But that that this this kind of cycle of tethers, like this, mm-hmm. I I guess, yeah, the, the image I had was intertwinedness, like that if we're all being tethers for each other, mm-hmm. it becomes this, you know, almost like a net. It becomes, oh, it becomes almost like having a structure to it. You know what sure. I mean? Sure, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's lovely. Um, so I really liked that. I mean, that that's how Flint saw what Silver did for him, and now what right. he wants to offer him. Yeah, um, I, I think I had said earlier in the season that I was not as convinced uh, with Maddie that mm-hmm. Flint was really Silver's friend. But mm-hmm. now I have no doubts. Now I'm yeah, really seeing right? his care for him. Yeah, and it's it's pretty touching. Well, and seeing here that Flint saw them as friends. I mean, this I felt like was this. That's the what episode, I mean. Yeah, this was, yeah mm-hmm. that this was the scene that if you ever doubted that Flint saw them that way. Right. There's just no no question. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yes, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if we continue to have that in future episodes. We don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a hard. It's it. This scene is hard on rewatch. Yes, because you get the end, and then and you see this before it. And again, the conversation at the end of this episode is not definitive at all. And we, you know, I'm looking forward to when we get there. Well, soon we'll be there. We'll discuss it. Right. But that that conversation could mean a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I feel like I feel like Silver when he does look up to Flint, he doesn't say, "Okay, fine, I trust you and you can, you know, you can help me not drown." But I feel like he's he he is allowed that. Like yes. in in this place that he's in before he finds out that Maddie's alive. Mm-hmm. He's ready to do that. All right, let's just talk quickly about the the conversation between the Queen and Julius before we get back to Flint and Silver. I like that we keep revisiting this question of whether war against civilization is a good idea. Right, yeah, yeah. And this was interesting because they didn't use the word civilization. He said the world, but we know what, what the writers are talking about here, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, and I like that the perspective is slightly different from someone who has just managed to get out of slavery. Yes. So if a person sure. who, of course. for a person who's so recently enslaved, I like that it's the world and not civilization, because I think that from his perspective, the world had enslaved him. You know what I mean? Like, sure. it's not, okay. it's not just, it's not just civilization versus pirates. It's it's the whole weight of the world, the pirates right. included. It's it's the way that the world mm. had been set up. Sure. Wow. Right? Because slavery exists in, you know, in in the fringe, in the mm. outside of civilization space as well. Right. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's what they're talking about, whether they can trust pirates or not, and that she's yeah. made this shift. Uh, I also like, you know, that he's 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 kind of making the vain argument like she he's like i don't understand why you want to do this and she said well there's no lasting security here and then he says well but we have this we have this cash we could have months or years of security right yeah where I mean, is this fortune give it to me now here in this room that that well, old vein well that vein, but also the vein that was arguing with eleanor when when uh when when she was trying to convince when Flint had come and was about to bomb the fort and he said he said, But we but we're safe now. We're here now. England's right. not gonna come after us and he said and she said, she said, I don't want I don't want a future that's right. that's measured in whatever she said, days or weeks or months no, or years even. Yes. Uh huh. Right. But whatever, but it's that same idea, like that that the Queen is arguing for something that is a gamble. Mm-hmm. but could be long-term for real. Whereas he's like, uh, I, I, I'm okay with the security that I have now right. that I can measure in months or years. Mm. So I really liked that it was like a callback even to that conversation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't put that together. I mean, just, yeah, this constant. And again, I, I like that the show doesn't take a side really. Like I feel like every time you have a conversation between people who, who are these big picture, you know, gamble for the, for the whole, you know, for the whole thing, people. And the, like, I just felt like both of them had compelling arguments. Yes. Yeah. 
I would agree. I just wanted to bring up also that I I think this might be the same porch that Flint and Silver sat on. Oh, they're sure. like, is this a warning or a welcome? Yeah. Porch? I think it might be. I kept looking at it, trying to figure out if like I could make sense <laughs> of the geography of the camp that way. But that's just, I, and I don't know, you know, I don't know if there's a significance in that other than like, this is the porch where people have important conversations. Sure. <laughs> <I Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay. So now we get to where they find out that Maddie's alive. Yes. So, okay. So they have this letter mm-hmm. and feel like I still haven't completely unpicked everything that's going on in this conversation. But Silver obviously only sees Maddie. Yes, definitely. Flint only sees he doesn't only see the war, he but he only sees the 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 big picture. I mean I feel like yes, Flint's actually the yes. person who's kind of seeing everything. Well but and the, the queen, queen also too, surprisingly. Right. But the queen's somewhere in between them, I feel like, because yes. she's obviously, it's her daughter. It's her so daughter, she sure, obviously has. But it is interesting that the queen is so emotionally bound to this decision. Yes. And yet also being very rational. Very practical. Yeah. Very practical. And again, well, and again, I think you're right, though, thinking about the big picture. I mean, mm-hmm. she doesn't only have her daughter's life to consider, but the lives of all of her people. Of course, of course. Right, right, right. Just like Maddie always, right. Right. That mm-hmm. she can't think about the one person, even if it's the yes. most important person to her, she has to think about everyone. Well, and especially because, I mean, she was just reminded by Silver that... Maddie died for a cause she believed in, which is such a Absolutely. reminder of how important this cause is to her. So it's like, um, it, it's, it's, it's almost reminiscent of Vane's little head shake to Billy, mm-hmm. you know, when mm-hmm. he's uh, th- this idea that some sacrifices are worth it for the sake of the cause. And, right. And to hear Silver just straight up ask Flint, is it worth her life? Or is this war more mm-hmm. important than her life? And Flint to say, yes, it is. Woo! Which is, of course, true. Of course, it's right. And she would have said that. Maddie would have said it. Exactly. That's the thing, is that Maddie would say the same thing. And this is the one thing mm-hmm. in this. This is the one, actually, moment that I was tempted to do chronological this time. Because mm-hmm. I think it's so crucial that we go from this scene to the scene of Woods Rogers visiting Maddie in the cell. And that we get oh, to hear from yes. her mouth yes. that she will die fighting. She's still die fighting. Yes. Uh-huh. But yeah, that's the thing is I just, I mean, you cannot blame Silver. I, you know, I just, my, my pain for him is so strong in this mm-hmm. moment. And I just, uh, yeah, I mean, I understand him so well, but it's true. I mean, this is a situation where if he got his way, he would be going against her wishes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And yeah, and, and oh, and Flint brings up exactly the thing that Woods Rogers is trying to do is to to split them up. He said, we can't, you can't, he can't. Yes, let us- which was great that he saw that right away. Uh, yeah. that, that actually surprised me a little bit, but he knew immediately that, that they were trying to do something divisive. Yeah. Well, he understands this. He understands he tactics. He <laughs> understands people and tactics and he certainly he's, understands Woods Rogers. Yes. Right. He's got a tactical mind. I mean, that's an interesting question. Like Silver understands people and he's good at working people in the moment, but does he have a tactical mind? Like, is he a big picture person? Really? It's that's possible that he's good not. That's a question. Right? No, I think he under, well... I think he understands and respects the big picture, but he doesn't necessarily have that intrinsic vision of it. Like, um, and, and for tactical things, like I think he knows a good plan when somebody tells him right. one, but he's not well, necessarily he, a formulator of those kinds of plans. Well, no, he's good at, I mean, he formulated the plan about getting the Urca gold. He can formulate plans, that is but true, I don't know. I suppose. If, no, but that's, that, um, that's different than like warfare. That's different than the kind of tactical planning that sure. Flint, that Flint and Woods Rogers yeah. have are trained to and obviously very good at doing. That's very hmm. true. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess we may see in 
the last yeah. three episodes. In we the may next episodes, of course. I'm terrified to see what plans well, Silver May had. There are only three episodes left, so oh, Liz, I'm so I know, sad. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> there are only three episodes left. Yes, I know. Alistair said that to me today, and I just lost my mind. I was like, "Wait, what? Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah." There's only three episodes left of my favorite show. I know, but it's going to so end many beautifully. Ever. It is. It is. It is. I know. I'm just already quite sad. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. So this ah, this scene is just again. This scene is so emotional and so beautiful. And Flint does remind him that if we are of one mind, we can do anything, which, you know, to this point, up until now, he has not been proven wrong about that thing. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. so far, I believe him. Like, (laughs) we have all the evidence is is pointing towards when they are of one mind, they really can do crazy shit. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, but this is, this is, I felt like just laying the emotional groundwork for the last scene and also God knows what's going to happen now. <laughs> right. Sorry, yeah. I'm super worried. I know. No, it's worrisome. Okay. So in the last scene, I want to bring up mm-hmm. whether or not it's a quarter deck. I keep forgetting to actually look up oh, if yes. I write when I keep calling sure. it a quarter deck. Why not? Israel Hands and John Silver are standing exactly the way Flint and Silver stood when oh. they approached the Maroon Island and did that amazing two anchor yeah. mooring. And that's where, that's where they said, that's where, you know, that whole thing with DeGroote where Flint said, well, I guess if both of us give them an order, they don't even know how to refuse us. It's true. They can't refuse. We had the exact same framing now of Silver and a different ginger Mm -hmm. suggesting possibly the breaking of that streak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that just put all of the fear in my heart in the whole world. (laughs) Yep. Yep. (laughs) To be honest, it was just like, Mm -hmm. I saw the two of them standing like that and I checked some of the shots and they're like such similar shots. And, and yeah, that just a fear in my soul. Of course. From that. And we still, I feel like we still don't know what Israel Hands is about, you know? No, like, he's, right? Uh, he's very compelling. He's very, God, he's just ferocious, right? He is that. I just feel like I don't, we don't know yet how he sees his relationship with Silver. Yeah. I mean, he seems very loyal to Silver. I don't know if that's true, but he seems it. He may be loyal, but again, I brought this up from the very beginning when he talked about what he did and talked about Teach as basically his backup. I'm not sure he sees himself completely as a subordinate the way we would expect. Oh, interesting. Okay. This is, I mean, I just, uh, yes, Israel Hands is just a glorious enigma still. Uh I really am enjoying him. I mean, as much as he terrifies me. He intrigued me from the beginning when he talked Mm -hmm. to Flint that time and talked about, you know, and he started putting ideas in Flint's head about Silver not always needing him. And now he's putting ideas in Silver's head or observing. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. the thing. It's like he has this intriguing way of speaking where it's like maybe he's observing. Maybe he sees too much. Like the how did he know that Silver took the cash out of the ground, you know? He's like super, super observant. Uh huh. We do get a lot in the season shots of Israel hands. Oh, but just... you don't think that he was part of the uh, the help to 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 dig it up? Not the way he said it. He said it like, "I know this thing that you thought I didn't know." Oh, I didn't get that. See, I, I saw no, this, I like, could be wrong. Conspiratorial. About... Okay, it could be. I could be wrong. Yeah. And I believe it was Kofi who was standing next to the cash, which means mm-hmm. that maybe the queen was involved in this choice, too. Oh, sure. It could be. Of course. Right? I didn't think of that. Yeah, sure. I'm pretty sure it was Kofi there guarding the guarding the chest. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't. Recognize. So it's just like, yeah. I just feel like we got these hints and I, I love mm-hmm. the way they framed it. I love this is what did this. This reminded me there's other ends of episodes like this that have similar type of music. And mm-hmm. this kind of like 
you're just finding out like literally at the very last seconds of the episode, the right. thing that is just like changes well, everything. It's the end of season one, <laughs> right? With a little nod between Flint and Gates. We had that. No, but I mm-hmm. think this maybe reminds me more actually of when I feel like the music reminds me possibly of when the like, do you want to see something shiny? Oh, sure. Uh huh. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, I just feel like the music just and the way the shot was towards the. See, now we just have to have, I'm just like making mental notes of questions we need to ask Lucas when he, sure. when he has time. We're trying to schedule uh-huh. an interview with Lucas again. Like I have all these questions for him. Uh-huh. He's probably thinks we're going to have all of our questions about like the battle scene in episode one. And I'll be like, uh-huh. no, we really must talk about seven. <laughs> uh-huh. um, yeah, it's just, I, uh, yeah, I can't wait to understand Israel hands. Like I'm looking forward. I mean, as much as I'm dreading the end of this mm-hmm. season, I'm so looking forward to like having the mystery of Israel hands unlocked so that when I yeah. go back and look at this season again, like I'll see all the nuances of how that was constructed. Mm-hmm. I'm really looking That's forward smart. to that. Yes, of course. Um, so yeah. Gosh, so, of right. So this whole idea of like, he's confident, but you're more confident because I guess, because you're prepared for his thing not to work out. Mm-hmm. And, oh God, it's just right. And then he says at the end, you're prepared for his failure. And he brings up the treasure, not in the ground anymore. And then he said, there's two roads. Either you concede to him or you kill him. Yep. Ooh. And now, and Silver looks at him. I don't see Silver's look necessarily as agreement. No, I think you're right. I, I, I think it was really. It was very vague, right? Yeah. I mean, it seemed to me that he was considering that. Right. And, and just considering whether or not he was willing to do that if it came to it. Oh, I think Silver has already made decisions about what he's willing to do and what he plans to do. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he's going to concede to Israel Hands that Israel Hands knows it or or got it wrong. Sure, sure. Got and it. this also goes back to our like slapping scene. Like oh, Silver's yeah. also behaving exactly the way Israel Hands basically demanded of him. Like he's not mm-hmm. going to waffle. He's not going to like talk it out with Israel Hands. Sure, that's right. Yeah, of course. So I don't know what to make of this and. Boy, does this make me want to see episode eight as soon as possible. <laughs> and I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, let's talk about NASA for a bit. And then we get then we get our dessert, which is Philadelphia. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Okay. I do feel a little bit bad for Woods Rogers now. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Not too Although bad. Right at first. Still pretty mad at him. Really I'm still super scary. mad at him. Sure. Right? When, when we first saw him with Mrs. Hudson, he was scary like unhinged Mm -hmm. i was worried for her and then when the guy came in and she was like you want to leave this room right now Mm -hmm. Uh, she was she was wonderful in this episode the actress oh my god uh, her compassion yes her compassion yes yes. i know um and also her her fear her fear for her own life absolutely and the two of them always in unison like she didn't villainize him in that moment she Which is amazing to, to me. It's amazing, yeah, that she had an understanding of what all he had lost. Although, I mean, again, he brought up her doing things for survival. I mean, I don't right. really know how it would serve her to villainize him right now. That is true. That is true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, she now understands what a scary bastard he can be. Definitely. Um, yeah, exactly. Um yeah, I mean, and it's interesting, this question about Jack Rackham, like, because we definitely saw the scene where her kind of spy contact, who I thought was Grindel, but then Grindel was a totally different person this season, so I don't really know. But her spy oh, contact yeah. mm-hmm. that she talked to in the marketplace, he did he did suggest that Spain would want Jack Rackham. Right. Mm-hmm. But I guess that they're referring to the fact that she chose to run with that and make it a, an actual demand of Spain sure. rather than just a suggestion. Um, I still, you know, I mean, I do think that Woods Rogers, because he eventually finds out of the pregnancy, like I, yeah. I still, when he oh. said that, like none of that sounded like anything Eleanor would do still made me mad at him. I was still mad yeah. at him for saying that for like, uh, not, uh, yeah, sure. Sure. Cause I was just like, seriously, <laughs> like, <laughs> My my Eleanor would totally do that shit. Absolutely. Yeah. And she did. Yeah. And she did. Exactly. 
but yes, but then he has the heartbreak. I'm sure I feel sad. bad for him. And he's in me. I mean, yes, he is heartbreaking. I know. Yes. Yes. When he's sitting with her and he's saying he's sorry. Mm-hmm. And what did you think about, you know, that vision that he had of Eleanor looking at him and then, and then that one tear. Uh, I, I, well, I thought it was lovely. That whole, that whole scene was gorgeous. Just visually. Gorgeous. I know. Incredible. Beautiful. Beautiful Incredible. scene. Incredible. Oh, Lucas Edlin. Yes. So that whole scene was gorgeous. Um, yeah, th- that's directors who are also cinematographers. Can yes. give you those really beautiful scenes. Yeah. So, um, I liked it. it re- well, it was really reminiscent of Flint seeing Miranda on the, yeah. on the deck when she climbed up, out, up out of the sea. Yes. For me too. It felt like a real mirror of the, a real callback to the, to yes. the dream sequences mm-hmm. and like, right. Like the coloring of her face was very Even, similar. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting. So like, do we think that this kind of like the dream sequences was a way of, of the grieving person to like find meaning and kind of work their way through their grief. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think so. Um, yeah. And I think just showing too how much they had not yet let go, how they had not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A a, a way of showing the processing of their grief. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I definitely still, I, I have not forgiven him. I definitely sure. feel like his sorries as as heart wrenching as they are, just too little, too late. <laughs> yeah, but he seems to. I mean, he no one knows that better than him. Yes, fine, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Complicated people. That's all I'm saying. Yep. Mm-hmm. I can simultaneously feel bad for him and be totally okay with the pain that he's <laughs> right. <laughs> all right, and then we have Billy. Show up. We sure do. He looks really rough, babe. I know. Are you okay, sweetheart? Oh, he, he needs looks more freaky. than a bath. He looks really, really freaky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That, is, that is some excellent makeup. I know. Freaky oh, ass makeup. Eye. Oh, yeah. Honey. I know. Yeah, my heart went out to him. I know. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm kind of glad we talked to Tom before this because we would have probably spent a really long time just like talking about how freaky this was yes. really haunting to me. It, Maybe well, more haunting so because sad. we just hung out with him. Maybe so. Yeah. Well, and he loves his character so much too. Yeah. So, yeah. But Billy, God, when he said, what was it? Just they all betrayed me or they turned on me. Mm-hmm. They turned My on me. My heart just broke. Billy was just so loyal to everyone and mm-hmm. to have it just count for nothing. Like he's making a bad choice. He's doing a bad thing. But yeah. mm, right. Oh, Billy. No, I mean, this is, we, the, he's doing bad things and, or he's about to do bad things, really bad right. things, really, really bad things to our person that we really, love really very much. Things. Yes. And yeah, I mean, you, and, I totally feel for him. I mean, this is, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I'm very torn. My Billy yeah. feelings are very, very confusing and complex right now. Yes, there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and I, I did want to ask, but because we jumped a, a little bit, mm-hmm. when he said, I am Long John Silver. Oh, I love that. Wasn't that great? It was like, finally, 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 you're being that person. Mm-hmm. Finally, he's being. The person who's like, I am the leader. Yeah. I mean, yeah. again, at the wrong time, with the wrong person, no. for the wrong purposes. Yes. But uh. if you just look at Billy's story, aside from all the other sure. stuff, there and was he's... a part of me that was so happy for Billy to finally finally own it. Like, finally own yeah, this place. Sure. Right. Exactly. It's like, okay, I didn't I don't need any more to like put push this other person forward mm-hmm. because I'm uncomfortable with that role. Right. Uh yeah, it's really hard to be excited for your character that you love and just like so upset about what they're about to yes. do. Yes. Yes. At the same time. I know. Yes. And and that's how I feel about Billy right now. Right. Like part of me is so proud of him. Like I'm Long John Silver. I'm the person who did all of this. Not Flint, not mm-hmm. Silver, no me. I did it. Yes. Mm, it makes uh, me proud. It does. Although, again, he's being a very bad boy. 
He's being a very bad boy right now. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Right. I mean, and that's a question. Like, had we watched this episode before talking to Tom, I would have asked him about that. Like, had had Billy found this inner strength earlier on, Mm -hmm. might there be tragedies now and in the future of the rest of this story that could have been avoided? Right. Like Certainly. perhaps the fact that Billy always pushed someone else forward. Mm-hmm. What did you, what did Tom say? Everyone needs to go listen to our episode with with Tom Hopper. It's fantastic. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, and yes, he we've called him Kingmaker, and that's not that is totally true. Billy has always been the Kingmaker, but he called him he called Billy also the Monster Maker. Yes, maker that's of right. monsters. So the question is, had Billy been more assured in his own leadership ability from the beginning, perhaps he would have taken control with the morality that Billy had Mm -hmm. instead of creating monsters. Who knows? I mean, that's, but it's, I think it's an interesting question. It is. No, you're right. Um, So, yeah. So, and, you know, he knows, obviously Billy knows exactly. Again, here I am giving Woods Rogers all this credit, like like in season three when Eleanor and Max gave him all of his strategies. Billy handed him this strategy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe maybe Woods Rogers is just really good at recognizing an opportunity when it comes to him and is not actually the sure. strategist I think he is. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Yep, because this one's Billy's strategy. Billy That's knows. True. Billy knows yeah, the maybe secret. A both. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, Woods Rogers knew Flint and knew the name yeah. Long John Silver, but clearly didn't even right. know who that, that that's represented. That's what was so strange. I was like, he's only got one. I mean, he's got both his so, legs. You know, it can't be that guy. Maybe they're both just understanding that they're talking figuratively. Right. No, no. That's, I mean, I think that is clear. Is that Bill, right. Is Billy right. said that I'm really Long John Silver. Like, there's this other dude, but yes. really I'm the one yes. who created yeah. him. Which, which was just is a true. smart conversation. Right. And I, yeah. And I just, yeah, I loved, I love the, uh, what does he say? Billy says, you know, if someone was so inclined and knew how, and he says, are you so inclined? Uh-huh. And what's Rogers like, do you know how? And then he says, you have the instrument to divide silver mm. and flint. And right. Rogers had no idea about this whole thing that the really what the, that the, that the center of the strength is the coalition between silver right. and flint. But mm. Billy knows. Yes, he does. Oh, Billy. Oh, Billy. Hurt people, hurt people. We've now mm. gotten a glimpse into how Billy becomes yeah. the man at the beginning of Treasure Island. Yes. Oh, right. Yes. A ruined, ruined man. Vengeance. Again, mm. can I just bring up Vengeance real quickly? Sure. Yet another episode where Vengeance just, I don't think I really need, to, I don't think this is a big prediction to say that Vengeance is going right. to end up biting Billy in the ass. Because again, we know who mm-hmm. he becomes. Vengeance just yes, we not serving people well. Right, right. Okay, so then we get to Maddie in chains. Mm. Um, I wanted to bring up that I feel like the light in the cell is similar to Flint, that it's kind of going over Maddie, but oh. not on her. Like that there is, again, a very strong beam of yeah. light, but it's like kind of like to the side of her, not on mm-hmm. her like it vein in the cell. Again, I don't right. know if this means anything. I just noticed it. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, Rogers wants to know about Eleanor. Does he understand? He probably does. Well, we just don't know. Like, do we think that he understands who Maddie is for Eleanor? And it was just interesting, like, the oh. way he said, like, I heard that you were with her when she died. He may have no sense of Maddie's importance to yeah, Eleanor's I life. Know. I don't right? know. That's a good point. I have no idea if he yeah, knows. Yeah, I don't either. But you know what I mean? It's one of those things mm-hmm. where it could be possible. But would he then connect, sure. even if he knew the story of Scott, like Eleanor just found out that Maddie didn't die in the Rosario Raid. So I'm mm-hmm. going to guess he doesn't know who she is for Eleanor. I think, I think you're right. I think doesn't, I think that he doesn't. I don't know. know if that would affect how he behaves in this situation. Yeah. At this point. Right. I right. Know. I mean, he's, yeah, he's also drowning. Yeah. Yep. He then gives her terms, which are terms that I think he knows she would never agree to. Well, I don't know. I think that he thought that there would be some some appeal. Except that Billy explained why she would be the instrument for dividing silver and flint. So for him to say, I mean, uh. it's one thing 
that she's a freedom fighter for enslaved people, right? Right. So, like, right. that would make sure. her not agree to to turning in slaves that show up on their island. Yeah, sure. That's but, true. But Billy, of course, explained her relationship to Silver. Mm, uh-huh. So if the price of this freedom, this quote unquote freedom, is turning in mm. all pirates, when when she's been established as the linchpin, yes, it seems to me like he's offering her a deal that there's that he knows she has that to. That he refuse. knows she won't take. Yeah, yeah, um, that's interesting. And then yeah, his threat is is horrific, mm-hmm. reminiscent of what the slaveholders on New Providence Island did, the idea of splitting mm-hmm. people up and selling them, selling, dividing uh, families by selling abhorrent. them. Abhorrent, yes. Abhorrent, right. Abhorrent is the right word for this. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. Just in case you were feeling bad for Woods Rogers, yep. let's remind you. a nice reminder of what he's capable of. Yes. Yep, exactly. And then we end with Maddie saying, Eleanor died fighting, and so will I. Mm-hmm. Damn, that woman, I love her. She's so great. Isn't she great? <laughs> I know. I, I hope we get so much more Maddie next episode. I just, I'm just feeling serious Maddie ep- deficit this episode. Definitely. Yes. Yes. That was not enough. Um, but I'm paid for my Maddie deficit. The whole lot of jacks. <laughs> yes. So much great Jack. Are you ready to go to Philadelphia? I am. Yeah. I just love Jack complaining about the cold. It was hysterical. Oh, I know. I'm gonna, okay. We have, yes, yes. We have to talk about that. Everything. His balls. All right, so we start our um, we start our Janex. I'm just gonna call it Janex. I don't care. I'm <laughs> calling it Janex because I love it. It makes me so happy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we start our Janex section with Jack taking care of Anne. He is so tender with her. This was. Remember when I said earlier on that I, I I hadn't seen Jack love Anne in the way that I felt like she needed. Hmm. I feel like I saw it this episode. He was mm. so tender and gentle with her. And that mm-hmm. little, the little hushing sound that he made, even as he was mm-hmm. uh, unwrapping the bandage. Yeah. God, it was so beautiful. So beautiful. So amazing. I know. And I love how they talked about Max. Like, I love, I love that, you know, Max peeks in and yeah. then Anne t- talks about how she didn't come back. Mm-hmm. He says, you told her to fuck off. She listened, which I liked. Yeah, I liked it too. And then mm-hmm. Anne discussed the thing that I was slightly uncomfortable with last episode. The, mm-hmm. the, the you know, this is where Max said, I, I won't apologize. And I like what Anne said about it. I mean, it kind of sold it to me. Like, I like the idea that that, that was about honesty, which is what Max claimed. But clearly Anne saw it. Like, clearly Max, that was the right thing for Max to say to Anne. Mm. It's true. Yeah. And the honesty was, I respect that a lot too. It would have been an easy mm-hmm. thing to lie. Exactly. And it was, it was, it was a sign of respect for Anne. Right. And it's good that she recognized that. Yeah. And actually my favorite part of this scene mm-hmm. was at the end when Jack said, you'll have plenty time, plenty of time her. to murder her. Because he said that the way someone would say a lullaby. You know what I mean? Like, he didn't say that with vengeance. He didn't say that, like, he said that because he knows who Anne is. Yeah. And well, then he said it, but now you need to rest, right? Right. Yeah. It was very sweet. Right? It was like, Mm -hmm. I mean, it just reminds me of when, when Toby was talking about Anne's character, like, that, you know, that. (laughs) <laughs> that murdering to her is like a part of, you know, killing is a part of who she is and like an art form. I just oh, loved it. Yeah. It was almost like, it was like, it's like, okay, sweetie, you can have that piece of cake when you're feeling better. Like right. it, just, <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, yes. you know what I mean? Like the tenderness mm-hmm. with which he said it was not, did not feel to me like him talking about vengeance that either of them would, would bring onto Max, but mm-hmm. was more about like, you'll be yourself again soon. Mm-hmm. I loved it very much. It was like very it just sweet. seemed it was just such a Jack and Anne moment. Like who else would say to their to their person like mm-hmm. it's okay you can murder again soon. <laughs> <laughs> it was so tender and so true to them at the same yes. time. Yes, definitely. is what I want to say about it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I I have like a crazy delight for this whole like scene about where Jack's complaining about the harbor taxes. Oh, I, yes. 
I love that. That was so that was a much. lot of fun. Jack is so delightful in this whole episode. I know. Did we not need Jack so much? We just I just felt like Yeah. Like thank you. We we really needed just a giant dose of Jack. Yes. Well, we had so many we had such rough episodes. Yep. It's true <laughs> just to take a breath for a minute. Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm just, yeah, I'm just delighted by it. But yes, I love him complaining about this. I love when Featherstone says, wait, and we're the thieves? And he's just listing all of these. He's just so... Yep. It was just such a beautiful thing of like, hello, you're in civilization now. You yeah, don't get it was, to just it was a like, civilization moment for sure. Right, just be wherever. It's like when Woods Rogers mm-hmm. complained about about the uh, insurance. Oh, that's it's right. Like, yes. Right. Yes. It's just like, I, I don't know. There's something I like about the, um, the mundane aspects of civilization and how they're so right. troubling to people also, like not just the big things like slavery and, you know, right. killing people, but just also this, min- this mundanity is just like a really nice contrast Mm-hmm. Uh, I also wanted to bring up specifically because they're in Philadelphia. One of the one of the taxes was a, <laughs> a voluntary contribution to the Society of Friends. Those are the Quakers, and Pennsylvania was oh, a. Oh, I wondered a, about that. Interesting. Yes, that Society of Friends are Quakers, and I. Lo- oh, okay. Nice touch. Nice touch. I went to a Quaker school. This is why I recognize ah. this. A voluntary contribution that was non-negotiable. <laughs> right, exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that just amused me. So then when he says he's going, I also love where he's telling Max she can't come and he's imitating her accent, which we've only had yes, once before, although yes, I felt like it was much better this time. Yes. 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 Yeah. He was really giving her the full, <laughs> the full Max impersonation. It was pretty cute. It was pretty cute. Mm-hmm. So that was lovely. And, you know, and it was interesting because I felt like in ador- in addition to being adorable and funny, uh-huh. it also brought up something that's going to be very important in these scenes with Jack, which is that the whole idea of his name takes on a different meaning yes. when you're in civilization. Oh, interesting. Okay. His name is now a danger to him. Sometimes. Like, we get a lot of okay, different versions sure. of Jack's relationship to his name yes. in these scenes. I was so the happy fir- for him when that girl... <laughs> I know. We was, we're Jack almost Rackham. there. We're almost I know, there. I but I was so happy. Okay. I know. We're almost there. No, no, because we have to make a really big deal of her. Okay. Because she's a pirate groupie. She is a pirate groupie. She's oh, my gosh. She's a pirate gosh. groupie. She is an actual uh, pirate groupie. Okay, we're not she there yet. She sure is. Okay, yeah. Okay, but yeah, but I like that the first time he says Jack Rackham, it's impersonating his vision of Max. By the way, like, can we just talk about how much it seems like Jack, you know, just has this interior monologue of Max in his head? Like, we got that, we got that last episode where he's, like, talking about how much, you know, his his idea of how Max would be saying, apologizing to him. And now we have this whole thing of like him imagining how Max would like sure. give him up to the authorities. I'm uh-huh. just like, how much time do we think Jack spends just like thinking up what Max would say? <laughs> <laughs> he seems a tad, he seems a tad bit fixated on this. on like Max, what Max would say. <laughs> I just, you know, as a Max lover, I find that delightful. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, but it is, but this is the thing where his name could be a danger to him. Yes. Uh, okay. And then we have Jack and Featherstone walking towards the Guthrie mansion. Oh my God, that house is so large. And Featherstone stands up for Max and I really like it. Mm-hmm. I just, I, and I think it's important for the progress of this episode, but I yes. also really, really respect Featherstone for bringing up the fact that Max protected him against right. Beringer. Yes. And yes. said she hasn't crossed anyone who didn't cross her first, mm-hmm. present company included. Mm-hmm. It's very true. No, I know. And I, I, I think you're right. I like that Featherstone comes to her defense and it's true. They're about to have to partner together in a new way. So it was well-timed. Exactly. But I really respect it. I mean, it just, I feel like I understand Anne mm-hmm. because, because Max was her lover. Like, so I understand right. that whole thing, but it was just like, you know what, Jack, seriously, like, come, you know, you've double crossed people as well. 
Like yeah, this is not definitely. And again, Jack doesn't hold a you know, he's still holding a little bit of a grudge, but I like that Heatherstone brought it up because mm -hmm. Max didn't do anything much worse than what other people do. Sure. And I think overall she's behaves a lot better than most people in our story. <laughs> that is very true. You're right. It's very true. Okay. And then, yeah, then Jack's standing outside of the door and he's very concerned and he's very concerned about, he's still like, we're still part of this battle, be battle of wills between Jack and Woods Rogers. Like he's mm -hmm. like, he's like, we've got nothing. But he's like, but really, if I fail, it would prove that he's the better man. All right. Now pirate groupie time. She was so delightful. She was so delightful. She was hysterical and sweet. And it, it made me so happy for Jack. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I'm happy and not happy. I mean, it's interesting because I feel like his his experience changes greatly over this conversation. It, it does. It does. But I, I just, yeah. Okay. She called him Go one ahead. of the giants, though. She did call him she a giant. Did. He he. His was the second name she mentioned after Edward Teach. Yep. 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 It's totally true. But I feel like as, you know, and he is a bit gleeful in the beginning, but the mm -hmm. fact that she that he understands how little of the truth she understands. I feel yes. like he gets deflated over the course of the he conversation. He does. He absolutely does. But that's important for him to know, too, is that right? his name and his story are not in his hands the way that he they're thinks not, that they are. They're mm -hmm. not in his hands. And that he can't, and he can't own up to it because he can't, again, this danger. Like, so when she says, she doesn't, he doesn't say, I'm Jack Rackham. He says, yeah, I knew him, too. Like, it's so, it's, it's so interesting because partly he's delighted. Like he does get that little smile, sure. but he can't say his own name. Yeah. Which I feel like he, I feel like he could have though. I mean, he's, he introduces himself immediately once he walks into that room. Right. He has to once he, I mean, but that's what's so interesting to me is like that, that his relationship to his name keeps shifting in this episode based on the mm -hmm. situation. Like, I, I think mean, I thought that, that it, the only reason he didn't say his name was to hear more about himself from her. Oh, that's possible. Sure. Because, oh, right. Because he wanted to hear his legend. Yeah. Okay, that totally makes sense. That totally makes sense. But then she moved on to Bane. Yes, she did. Yeah. And then we got that beautiful eulogy for Vane, which was mm. really gorgeous. So beautiful, right? Yeah. Yep, it was really wonderful. And he said that line. He said, loyal to a fault. Loyal to a fault. Ain't he just, yep. Mm -hmm. Right, but that's the thing that Vane said about Billy. Proper pirate and loyal to a fault. Oh, good pull. Yes, yes. So that, yeah, that just, I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe he just said that. Mm. Like, clearly this was a thing with them. Yeah. Now we know. Oh, that's sweet. I know. And then right when he started talking about the honesty in a world that doesn't recognize that, sure. that's when she starts talking about cutting off heads and boiling, boiling his people enemies. And making them in stew. Oh. And, oh, honey. Yeah. I know. I know. And I love that his response to that wasn't like, oh my God, you're crazy. But like, why would he do that? Right. Yeah. And you believe this? Yeah. And that was a perfect response because she's so living in this mythology. Yes. And he's living in his own experience of of the of their lives. Sure. And so it's not just that he wants to refute it, he's just like, Why would anyone do that? Like yeah. what what's the purpose of that? And so I just love that mm -hmm. very much. It says, and you believed this. And she said, I read it in a newspaper, which was great. great. That was another was great. jab at civilization. That is a jab at civilization. That is a jab of civil at civilization now. Today. To be honest. Uh -huh. you no, know, I yes. know it. Yeah. But, I, but the truth isn't nearly as interesting. Mm. Right. I love the layers of this because Jack's always been about creating the mythology of himself. Yeah. And here he sees how little that's worth. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything because someone's mm. going to say suddenly yep. that he was boiling someone's skin. Yes. And I love also, I mean, this, this actually relates to what John said about how they see this story in relation to treasure Island mm -hmm. that he said that. So John Steinberg said, anyone who's not listened to this interview, go find it and listen to it because you know, 
seriously. It's beautiful to listen to all the things he had to say about the way that they created this story. Mm-hmm. But he said that um, that they saw Treasure Island as basically the story told based on the truth that is the reality that we're watching in Black Sails. Right, which is so cool. Mm -hmm. So this is a version of where you already are seeing the construction of the stories Mm -hmm. told in the world based on the things we know. We know what Jack knows. We know know the story behind Ned Lowe and his head. Mm -hmm. We know that Vane didn't boil people. But we're getting a glimpse now into the world that told stories about the pirates that we know so well. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're having a similar experience to Jack in a way. Interesting. Okay. I just felt like, yeah, this little, silly, wonderful conversation that mostly my first response was like, pirate groupie, an actual pirate groupie. We talk about pirate groupies. Yes. Um, I just felt like it actually had so many layers on it that relate to so many aspects of the story, including Mm -hmm. our our experience as an audience of this show. That's very interesting. I like that. Okay. So then we'll get to Joseph Guthrie, where, again, Jack uses his name and he gets the... He gets the experience of someone actually. The whole room right? knew his name and g- gave that like, really? Yeah. Right. Again, I felt I felt proud for him. Yeah. But a lot of good it did him. Nope. Yep. Well, uh, and again, I feel like he should have been more sensitive to that, to, to knowing. Um, he tried. He tried to get Joseph Guthrie to come speak to him in private. That's true. That's true. I mean, there was, he went into that room, a room that was constructed for Joseph Guthrie to publicly say no to him. Yes. Yes. There was mm-hmm. nothing Jack could do to have changed that sure, situation. Sure. You're right. Mm-hmm. And this is the flip side. I mean, this is the thing about all of them as outsiders, all of them being people who have been rejected by civilization. Mm-hmm. He was going to be rejected. There was no way he was not going to be rejected because Joseph Guthrie at that moment had ensconced himself in civilization. Yes. Hmm. And you can be a famous pirate all you want. You can be a giant. Joseph Guthrie standing around with those men will never recognize you. Yes. Yep. And you won't be taken seriously or respected. Yep. Nope. But Grandma Guthrie. Amazing. Yep. Let's roll her out. (laughs) We're at the Grandma Guthrie part of our conversation, and I'm so happy because I've been waiting. I mean, this is a great episode. I recognize that. There's amazing things. Whatever. Grandma Guthrie. (laughs) Well, tell me why you love her so much then. Oh, God. Okay, this is a big topic. I love Grandma Guthrie for so many reasons. I mean, I love her for her own basic badassery. Right. Which she definitely has. Yeah. Right. Which she definitely has. And again, yeah, we'll get into it then scene where Max comes in. I think I'll, that's where I really want to talk about the nuances of that. Mm-hmm. But again, we are we are experiencing this episode with the ghost of Eleanor, right? There's just no way yeah. we're not experiencing this. Sure. Mm-hmm. And my initial response to Grandma Guthrie, other than, you know, badassery, is just mm-hmm. like, look at this family. Yeah. This is a family that have women, strong women mm-hmm. who run the shit out of things. Yep. Yep. I, mean, I did write that down in my notes is, okay, this is where Eleanor gets it. All right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So that's, that's my first response. And then, you know, basically I could watch Jack and Grandma Guthrie talk to each other forever. Possibly the only thing I love more than that is Max Mm -hmm. and Grandma Guthrie talking to each other. It's funny because it's actually a little bit reminiscent of the way that that Max and Jack circle each other. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's get to that when we get into the Max episode. But yes, absolutely. I think that there's uh, that's not accidental. No. So, okay. So, but first we have the thing where she says, wait outside. And I just... I love it. I love this woman who pretends to be shopping while wheeling and dealing and making a deal, mm. maybe behind her husband's back. Like, we don't quite understand yeah, the relationship. Like what, of the two. Yeah, how their relationship I goes. Don't, yeah. I don't know if it matters. I mean, I feel like the conversation later about the cat m- implies that this is totally behind her husband's mm-hmm. back. It does. But, it does. Mm-hmm. but I love it. And she says, you know, she explains to Jack where he went wrong. 
again, mm-hmm. I think he was predestined to go wrong. Like this whole yeah. setup by Joseph Guthrie, there's not like something different Jack could have done. It was, mm-hmm. it was a bit of civilization theater in a yes. way. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, civilization and- theater, I like that. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm just going to make everything into a form of theater, but it is Mm -hmm. in this world. Everyone's doing theater of some sort. Mm -hmm. Uh, We just spent a lot of time with pirate theater. So there's other, there are other forms of theater. And I like what she says. She's like, his interests have multiplied tenfold with the ninth largest fortune in the Americas. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like a man who discards opportunity? Just no, because of what the neighbors think. Right. Mm-hmm. And she says, what does that tell you? And I just, yeah, this is one of those scenes where I just have to quote everyone. She says, what does that tell you? And Jack says, either Joseph Guthrie is one of the 10 luckiest men in the new world or that his business is not entirely managed by your husband. Mm. I love that. And then I love how he mirrors that, what he said to describe himself. And what she's not looking at him the whole time. Well, mm-hmm. she says, there's merit to your proposal, but I haven't decided yet on your merit. Right. Why would I partner with a pirate? And then he says, in all the years the Guthrie family mm-hmm. has had a connection to NASA, I'm the first pirate to have your ear. Either I'm the luckiest pirate of them all. Oh, uh-huh. Or I'm of a different sort. Yep. So I just love that, like, that two parts, the lucky and the, Mm -hmm. like, what's actually going on. Sure, So he basically said, because he recognized her in the first part, that she's the one in charge, he's saying, really what I'm saying is, I'm different and you should look at me. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And then she does. And then she looks at him. She absolutely did. Yeah. No, I love it. I love it. I love, right. They are circling each other. And this is Jack as at his smartest. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. this is Jack using all of his tools. Mm-hmm. Yes, to great effect. Like, and mm-hmm. it's fun, and it's wonderful. And this woman sees him in the way. It's funny. It's you know all of his ideas of fame. The way that Jack Rackham needs to be seen is this. Yes. Yeah, it's really really neat. Okay, and then Jack explains to Max why she needs to come with, and and it's perfect. I mean, he gets it immediately. He understands. Mm-hmm. And I love the way he explains it. And I love this recognition of Max. Yes, which is so important, especially as frosty as they have been to one another. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, understandably frosty. Understandably so. But right. yeah. But yes, he says that she needs to see a woman quietly yielding power. Let mm. me repeat the word quietly. That's yielding right. Yielding power. Quiet power. Uh-huh. Least perceived. Sure. Exactly. That will remind her of herself. Mm-hmm. Which is very smart. And can we talk for a second about how great Max's shawl is? Because it's amazing. (laughs) Absolutely we can. So beautiful. And then also we saw just for a second Adele's. That Mm -hmm. was towards the end, I guess. But anyway, yes. High fashion in this episode. Lots of great coats. Oh, right. We didn't talk about the cold. We didn't talk about the talking about cold, which just cracked me up. So cute and funny. Oh, my gosh. It cracked me up. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was adorable. And Hannah talked about this, that she was envious that she didn't get to go to fake Philadelphia in South Africa, where it's like a hundred and something degrees, and so they're all talking obviously. about how cold yes. they are. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I always, like, I know everyone's doing the, the best they can, but the fake snow on trees just throws me out every time. Every time. It doesn't matter the show. I'm like, come on, y'all. Who are you fooling? Uh, well, yeah. Yes, they are in South Africa. It's really, they're really, doing the really best hot. They can. I know. Hey, it's but cute. you know what? Everyone did really good cold acting. I've got they to say, did. like they yep. seemed really like they were cold. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Now we get to the meeting with Max and Jack and Grandma Guthrie. And mm. the first thing I want to say is Max is on the inside. This is the yes. type of room that she talked about looking through the window. And, and you saw that look she gave kind of looking around. She's on the mm-hmm. inside of one of those rooms now. She sure in is. this There's world. Girl. Mm-hmm. Yep. I know. Very proud of our looking girl. Looking a this... little bit uncomfortable to be there at first, but yes. Well, um, I, yes, I, I find, I find her emotions through this to be so quiet and so beautiful and mm-hmm. so moving that she, this is so hard for her, what she's doing. And she does it so beautifully. And I feel like you really feel both of those things. Mm -hmm. Also, Grandma Guthrie is doing embroidery. Yes. 
And this is the thing. This is the thing. A powerful woman Mm -hmm. who's playing the part Mm -hmm. exactly and doing embroidery just like Eleanor in the first episode. Mm -hmm. Eleanor wasn't good at it yet. And she definitely said fuck when she (laughs) stuck herself in the finger. Yep. But I love this. I mean, I guess now I can talk about the thing that I find so beautiful and haunting about this scene is the idea that Eleanor never met her grandmother. Mm. That Eleanor, unlike Maddie, was never trained to wear the crown. Yes. Mm -hmm. And never had a mentor. I mean, think about had Eleanor had this mentor. Imagine, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But I just felt like for all of the interesting thing that's going on in this scene for itself, the thing that's there and just kind of hovering over it all the time is the is is Eleanor is yeah. is the the that potential that Eleanor could have it. been yes that this woman is Eleanor had she had a different circumstance right. had she had a different childhood or a different life or mentors or 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 this woman as a mentor I mean right. God can yeah. you imagine the woman she would have become with it's this woman guiding her yes ah right? oh, yes. I want that alternate universe, please. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Hannah talked about about the uh, t- about writing having uh, having Toby write her the book where what is it the choose your own the choose your, choose own, your story own adventure book. or something. That's right. right. Yeah, you can follow her tales with Grandma. Oh right. man! Now that's the one I want. I want that the one where story. Eleanor and yep. where Eleanor's mother did choose to leave NASA and mm-hmm. went back, and Eleanor Ooh. grew up with this woman guiding her. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Right? But she lives longer. Yeah. Well, she definitely would. Well, she likely would have lived longer. Yes. But imagine the power. Like the Eleanor, Eleanor not flailing. Eleanor right. actually knowing who she is and mm. having the guidance and having and being without the abandonment and all of that and having a woman teach her how to be strong in a quiet way. Yes. Mm, which yes. Max had just kind of started teaching her right before she died. Yeah. But to have oh, someone yes. to have someone actually teach her that, someone who actually is an older woman who's a family mm. member, which is something Eleanor never had, really. Right, absolutely. Her mother died when she was young. She just never had any older family, female family member. Mm-hmm. But to have this one. It would be extraordinary. No, I agree. Yeah. Sorry. I, just, I Yeah, I could talk about that a lot. Again, Go on Patreon. Hannah and I talk about it quite a bit. (laughs) Um, So, yeah. So Max is doing this amazing, has this amazing combination of humble and capable. I love the grandma Guthrie that, that Jack starts explaining Max. And she says, does she speak? Yep. Gorgeous. Love it. Uh Love it. Smash the patriarchy. I like it. Although she did ask Jack at first who this is. So it's not like Jack was I know. being presumptuous. It was a little bit snarky, actually, but yes. No, it was beautifully snarky. I love it. She's just, yeah, she's just putting Jack in his place. I mean, mm-hmm. and that's kind of, again, that's another theater. I mean, I think, you know, sure. this is this this scene is about Grandma Guthrie and Max mm-hmm. connecting with each other. It's not about Jack. I mean, even though he's delightful. Right. Um, I love when they sit down, like she gives up the books and Grandma Guthrie says that, you know, her basically her accountant person needs to look at it. And then they mm-hmm. sit down on the sofa and Jack starts saying something. Mm-hmm. And then immediately Grandma Guthrie interrupts him. And the uh, he looks like a five-year-old child that had been, you know, that had been scolded. I just, mm-hmm. his face, his whole attitude, he yep. just, it was he's just like, oh, I know it was Jack adorable. He's so just so good in this whole episode. I know. He's just so out of his element and he just, yes. well, it's just, and I also just, I love Jack with women. Like I'm starting to like this mm-hmm. whole thing I felt like has been established all along that, you know, I, I forgive him even when he's on the ship and he says no women. Like right. he, he has, he's powerless against women. Mm-hmm. He understands women. I mean, that's why it's so beautiful that it turns out that it's a woman who's running this show. And that's sure. who he ended up having to talk to. Yeah. Cause he's just so much better at talking to women than he is to talking <laughs> to men. Mm. He really is. And yet at the same time, he's just so, 
moved by women that he's right, a bit yeah. he's like powerful and powerless with them at the same time does that make sense actually yes that makes complete sense yeah i i just really i'm just over the four seasons but especially lately i've just fallen in love with jack's totally contradictory and beautiful relationship to women in general mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know like even back in the when he had when he was running when the he brothel, first took over the brothel to. right uh-huh Right, and he just didn't know how to deal with them. Mm-hmm. I just, I love, I don't know, Jack Rackham. I love you, Jack Rackham. <laughs> um, <laughs> so then Grandma Guthrie tells this story about the cat. Yeah, which was fascinating. Uh, I, I felt like I wasn't quite following, I didn't quite follow the whole metaphor. I don't know if we're supposed to, because Max seems to follow Exactly. I think I was a little bit lost until Max said somebody has to go out and drown the cat. Mm -hmm. I got that. I mean, I think, right. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing that's important about it is that it's a cycle in which everyone is compelled or has no choice to play their role. That's, Mm -hmm. I don't think there's like, I don't think you need to like do a one to one comparison of who is which thing in that. Right. Because that's where I got lost. Right. Yeah. That's where I was like, well, then who is the cat? But I think you're right. right, That it's more to do with how you approach solving an unsolvable problem and the cycles. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Right. And that, and that cycles exist in which each player in the cycle is compelled to be the part that they play. Yes. And if they're compelled to be that part, the cycle can't be broken because they're Mm -hmm. always going to play that same part. Right. Right. The cat will always have hunger. Richard Guthrie will always have compassion. Joseph Guthrie will always have anger. Therefore, yes. the cycle will repeat itself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the, but the beautifully implied part of this is that the woman who sits outside and watches this cycle, yes, is the one who understands the the players mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and what compels them to be the players and potentially could stop the cycle. Yes. God, I love that. It's so smart. It's so lovely. And it's such a great promise for the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And just the recognition of Max. Just like, I love that when Max says this, I feel like there's, she's implying that that might be what Grandma Guthrie actually went. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. This recognition, like, I understand you. We both understand people. We both control we both wield power quietly. Mm-hmm. We are of the same ilk. Yes. And we know how to stop cycles. Mm. And we're not recognized. I mean, this. Right, right. No God. one knows when you sneak out into the woods. Yep. Right. But also just all this stuff about, God, I, I love this. I mean, I could li- I could talk about this scene for an hour, I think. And I won't do that to everyone, but I could. <laughs> But I love when the accountant brings up the laborers when he says, I don't yes. see your other uh-huh. laborers. And this is so powerful. And then she says, you're not from NASA. And she gives a good explanation for why mm-hmm. one wouldn't have slaves. Although we sure. know that that's not the case mm-hmm. because Jack had slaves. Yes. Jack had slaves sure working did. on the fort. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he did. Mm-hmm. No, no, he did. He did. No, and I, I know that, love- no, I was just remembering that it didn't. Right. Yeah. It, it was not uncomplicated, but he did. Mm-hmm. Right. And, she, and then Grandma Guthrie is the one who understands that it wasn't, it's not just those practical things. She says, mm-hmm. that's not the only reason. And Max, oh my God, Max, I love you so much. Like, I feel like this is it. This was the end. This was the full cycle of her backstory now is that she says, I've been bought and sold. Therefore, I won't be a slave Mm -hmm. nor a master. And then you see Jack look at her. Get a shot of Jack recognizing Max, Mm -hmm. recognizing something that I feel like maybe he always saw in vain. You know, he in vain hashed this out. Mm -hmm. But possibly a moment of him recognizing that thing that I've always said that Max and Vane have in common. And then it's so mm-hmm. crucial that they have this in common. They dealt with the fact that they had been slaves differently, but this commonality between them, I think has to do with their purity. Oh, interesting. 
Okay, sure. That their morality stems from the fact that they had both been subjected as children to the th- the most immoral thing of the moment. Yeah, all. sure. Oh, God. And there yeah. is this poignant moment where Jack, Re- I feel like, I mean, for me, one of the most important moments in this scene mm-hmm. is the shift in Jack's face when she says that and he recognizes yes. this about yes. her. Mm-hmm. But the thing that Grandma Guthrie recognizes is not that, is that she asks, how does one go from being a slave to being in this library in Philadelphia? Mm-hmm. And Max says... What difference does it make? Mm. And it's hard for Max to say all this stuff. I think Max yeah. would have way preferred yeah. to just get away with her business explanation. Sure. But that's the moment when Grandma Guthrie recognizes her. That's mm-hmm. the moment when she stops cold what she's doing and really looks at Max. Yeah, I don't even think this is smart. You know, I don't think this is her being fast on her feet and anticipating what what grandma Guthrie wants to hear. I think that it's that Max has finally met a woman like herself, a person like herself. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. She, she understood this implicitly because they are the same in many ways. Mm-hmm. Wow. And again, I uh, think for Max, for Max to finally be in a room like this, the room that she used to look in from the window And for that room to be Eleanor's family's room, for it to be the place of the woman who has died, who was her love, Mm -hmm. to be in that room with that woman's grandmother. And if I recognize the potential of that different story that Eleanor could have had with her grandmother. Yes. Yes. There's no way that Max isn't seeing that. I mean, just my heart is just breaking mm. for Max every oh, of course, minute of, of watching course. this interaction. Mm. No, I didn't think of that at all. That's very smart. I just, yeah, my heart just breaks all. I mean, again, I love this scene so much. And the scene breaks my heart to pieces from every direction possible. And it has so much potential. Yes. No, it, it was... And, again, visually, a beautiful scene. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And has its comic moments, too. Very well balanced. Yeah, yeah. Super beautiful. Okay, but then we have the big question at the end, which is, what happens if the cat fights back? And we are just going to find out, I guess, right? We are. And, again, it helps if we know... Who's the cat? What are we? <laughs> I feel like the show yep. is giving us conflicting answers because the next thing you see mm-hmm. chronologically is the red coats bringing the letter right about Maddie. So then you're kind of you have the implication that was Rogers is the cat, right? But Which makes sense. But the next scene we find out that Jack that the, that Grandma Guthrie has demanded that Jack kill Flint, which would make Flint the cat. Yes, it certainly does. Yes. But maybe they're both kind of the cat. I mean, again, we have spoken yeah, many sure. times about sure. how these two have many parallels to each other. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Right. I don't, yeah, again, we we know how this episode ends, so I don't know if it matters so much who the cat is. We know what Grandma Guthrie has demanded. And again, That's it would true. be the ruin yes. of both of them. The plan then would be the ruin of both Flint and mm. Woods Rogers because it would lead to Flint's death and Woods Rogers would then, I mean, what Jack proposed to Joseph Guthrie is that if you bought up Woods Rogers debt, he could right. be put in debtor's prison. And again, do we need to go into the history of debtor's prison? I mean, Jack brought this up with Woods Rogers in the carriage. Like this was mm-hmm. a time when people who were in debt could actually be put into prison for that thing. Right. Oh man. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. And a prison of hard labor mm-hmm. in theory to pay back that debt, but you could, you know, Goodness. you could spend your whole mm-hmm. life paying back some debts. Yeah. So that's, yes. so right. The it whole plan is the based on that. Mm-hmm. And it would be the ruin of Woods Rogers. It sure um, would be. Yeah. Okay. So let's now talk about Jack and Anne. They're so lovely. This seed breaks my heart. I'm, Again, in so many ways. Okay. So Jack explains the practicality that he needs to kill Flint. Right. Anne does not 
understand. Well, or maybe Anne understands better than Jack. Because she says, how are you going to do this? And he says, well, I need to do this and I need to do that. And I need to do this, but I need to do it without you. And she's like, that's not actually what I'm asking you. Mm -hmm. She said, how can you be the person that does this thing? Yeah. Who betrays your brother and betrays the memory of Charles Vane. And this is where it's so beautiful. Because Jack finally, I think, actually turns his back on his name. He says, Charles Vane is dead. Oh, oh, Jack. But that he'll do this for Anne, for them and for their life together. Oh. He says, I do this for us. Yeah. And what's he say? That's how it started in the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's how it started and that's how it's going to end. And again, the kiss he gives her is so lovely and tender. I was ready for another forehead kiss. Yep. It is not a forehead kiss. Especially because he's been very fatherly to her Mm -hmm. throughout this whole episode. Mm -hmm. And then to have that reminder of their romantic love was really powerful for me. Yep. And thank you, Lauren Sarner. I had thought this was the only kiss on the lips just so i can break your heart further the only other kiss on the lips was after the carriage scene oh that was the only other one yeah i bet it was yeah wow yep so i find this tender and beautiful and terrifying yes no it is it is i don't know what it means in the beginning i don't think that the both of them can walk out of this right out of the the show yeah and that's it jack i mean in my eyes that's it jack he this might be the moment where he came to the place he needed to be where he understood Mm. that it's not about his name he's willing he's willing to give that all up he's willing to give up Mm -hmm. his loyalty to a dead person and his name and his allegiance with the pirates and the giants for the sake of Anne. yes so lovely Mm -hmm. that's not where we end we end with him in very few words making an agreement Telling with Max. Max. Yeah. Yeah, that she'll look after her. Oh, which was heartbreaking too. I'm very afraid that this is the end of Jack. Oh. God, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not too, but his prospects don't look good left, here trying to, try kill to kill Flint. Flint. Yeah. Mm. Oh, God. I don't like it. I know. Well, no, I mean, my biggest fear, I mean, aside from my always fear that Jack will die, is. I mean, that's mm. it. He's he's now going south, and Max and Anne are yeah. staying in Philadelphia. Mm. Even if I, I just, I'm not sure I can take the idea of not seeing them together again. I've seen, I know. Oh, I know. Yeah, I hate to think of the two of them apart. I can't imagine how long it's been since they were. Right, exactly. I mean, probably never, right? Since they met. When I she mean, was, what, he 13? went, you know, when we had the whole Linus, you know, Pirate Captain sure, School. That's sure, right. they were apart for right. a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, not yeah, yeah. not like this. No. Yeah. Mm. I know. Wow. Yes. Poor dear. I know. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Well, this was delightful and super scary. This is the this is the it episode was. of Delightful and Scary. <laughs> All right. Are you ready to move on to our game? Ready to guns! Full compliment. Well, I'm pretty sure that you gave away your favorite part, but you can go ahead and say it again just for the sake of funsies. Grandma Guthrie. I love Grandma Guthrie. She's my favorite part. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe that's not specific enough, but I love Grandma Guthrie something crazy. No. No, that's good. All right. Uh, I have to go with uh, Jack's conversation with the pirate groupie. <laughs> Excellent. I think we both we both kind of tipped our hand, didn't we? (laughs) I think we may have just a bit. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. We loved what we loved. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our last thesis that Liz and I decided on for episode six of season four was: it may take some time before we fully know all that we have lost today. Mm -hmm. Which was Jack's line. Yeah, I like that. Yep. And there were two people who got it right. Yep. So. All right. One is at M the Beastie, Cassandra McKillum, who actually. Cassandra McKillum. Who is actually. What? Sorry. 
I, nothing. I just, I still like that You're name. You're just liking good. that name. <laughs> awesome. And now you get to name her a ship because she is a captain. No way. She got all the way to captain mm-hmm. already. That was so quick. I know. She's doing really She's well. fierce. Okay. Uh, yeah. Cassandra McKillum gets, let's see. I'm going to say the Triton. All right. Congratulations. Yeah, way to go. Gosh, that's so impressive. I know. I feel like I, I know. just named her. I know. It has been quite fast. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. And our next person is at Theo. Oh, I'm having a hard time reading this, this one. At Theo Desetia. Maybe I'll the look The odd up. tea set, I thought it was. The odd teacup. Oh, that makes sense. The there oddest we... teacup. What is it? The oddest tea. The oddest tea. Oh, I love that. Oh, my goodness. Okay, let me. (laughs) It's like the Odyssey, but it's the Odyssey. Oh, my God. I'm totally in love now. (laughs) Give her an an amazing name, please, because she did wordplay on, oh, God, on the Odyssey and teacups at the same time. I don't know if this. I know. Okay, now, now heartbroken. Yep, pretty heartbreaking. Okay, so let's see. Thank you, New Pirate, for breaking my heart by having the Odyssey and T in the same name. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to combine T and an Odyssey character. All right. And call her Ceylon Circe. Oh, yay! That's I also awesome. like it because Ceylon is T, but it's also like Ceylon, mm-hmm. like like with sails. It you know. is. So, and we're doing yeah, serious. Like a ship. This right. works really well. Right. It's a three way pun. All right. I hope you're happy. All right. Ceylon Cersei. That's fabulous. And right. And already <laughs> her Twitter handle is already a play on words in the same sort of way. So, all right, let's wrap. Emily Clark. Emily Clark, you rock. Hope you awesome. love your pirate name. This mm-hmm. is great. Fabulous. Thanks so much. All right. So, next week. <laughs> Uh, after this episode has dropped, you have until next Thursday to do your thesis statement for episode seven. Again, the game is on Twitter and you, uh, you have to guess what Liz and I have agreed is the thesis statement for this episode. And you tweet Mm -hmm. it with the hashtag S for thesis and just check on Twitter. We'll announce when, when you should start. All righty. Thank you, everyone, for playing. And uh, and also, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. I think that this season is really calling for a revival of Hamill sales. Oh, why not? So much right? fun. So we're not going to do it quite yet. We'll announce it soon. But, you know, you can mm-hmm. always start preparing. But I feel yes. like season four really uh aligns probably pretty well with the second act of hamilton in particular so yeah well i'm willing to wait for it yeah (laughs) 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 so yes you got your jokes you got your jokes (laughs) so yeah so everyone start preparing we'll announce it soon we'll do this on twitter and if you're not familiar with this we did this Mm-hmm. sometime during season two or three that we announced. So go on Twitter, check out the hashtag Hamill sales. We used lyrics from Hamilton combined with gifts or images that were appropriate from black sales. It was so much fun. It was tons of fun. Yeah. Check that hashtag for sure. Yes. Especially if you like both black sales and Hamilton, which seems, <laughs> seems like there's a whole lot of crossover. Mm-hmm. <laughs> soon the hannah new episodes will be out yeah and i can't wait to listen to that that was such a great conversation yeah and definitely join us for our live tweets of each episode on sunday nights mm-hmm. we'll see you there all righty until next time from common room radio i'm liz stevens and i'm daphne Alou. Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag FathomsDeep and follow us on Twitter at BlackSalesCast. 
We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive, and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening. Thank you.